Roberta, do we have enough folks to um, begin the meeting? Yes, I believe we're only missing TAC members from Rohnert Park, Sonoma, and Marin Municipal Water District. Everybody, everyone else seems to be present. No, Jack Gibson is here for Marin Municipal. Oh, sorry, Mr. Gibson. Right. Okay, um, Roberta, are you and Gina ready if we start? Yes, we're ready. Okay, then welcome everyone um, to our August 2nd, 2021 meeting. Um, I'd like to remind the WAC members and TAC members to state their agency and name for roll call uh, and when making comments. And um, also make sure that um, folks are on mute on their phones or microphones when they're not speaking. Um, and with that, um, Secretary Atha, could you please do a roll call for me? Yes, City of Katati. Yes, Susan Harvey here. City of Petaluma. Mike Healy, City of Petaluma. City of Rohnert Park. Willie Linares, City of Rohnert Park. City of Santa Rosa. Tom Schwedhelm, City of Santa Rosa. City of Sonoma. Jack Dean from the City of the Sonoma. North Marin Water District. Jack Baker, North Marin Water District. Town of Windsor. Sam Salmon, Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. John Foreman, Valley of the Moon Water District. Marin Municipal Water District. Jack Gibson, Marin Municipal. And now the TAC members, City of Katati. Greg Scott, City of Katati. City of Petaluma. Kent Carruthers, City of Petaluma. City of Rohnert Park. City of Santa Rosa. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water. City of Sonoma. North Marin Water District. Peru McIntyre, North Marin Water District. Town of Windsor. Christina Goulart, Town of Windsor. Valley of the Moon Water District. Matt Holner, Valley of the Moon Water District. Marin Municipal Water District. Uh, Paul Sellier, Marin Municipal. And as far as public attendees, we have, um, and staff, we have Barry Dugan, Brad Sherwood, Brenda Edelman, Brian Kay, Claire Nordley, Colin Close, Jake Spaulding, Jim Grossi, Larry Russell, Lynn Rosselli, Mark Milan, Paul Selsky, Peter Martin, Shannon Catula, uh, Steve Han Stephen Hancock, and Tony Williams. Uh, thank you for that. So welcome everyone. So we will move on to the next item, which is public comments. We are now taking public comments on non-agenda items. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, then, um, Secretary Perez, are there any live public comments? I am not seeing any raised hands. I am not seeing any raised hands either. Um, then, um, Drew, do you have any um, read or um, recorded public comments left via voicemail or email? I do not. You do not. Okay. So, we will end public comment. And with that, we will move on to item three, which is- um, Chair Harvey, then... I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, yes. I, I have a hand that keeps coming up and going back down uh, for Brenda oh. Edelman. Let me see if she would uh, like to speak. That would be fine. Thank you so much. Brenda, I've um, enabled your mic. Did you wish to speak under public comment? Yes, I do. Okay. Thank you, Brenda. Thanks. Um, I want to make a few comments. I was looking at um, the various different websites to see how you were publicizing the um, the very serious problems with Russian River water levels at this point in time. And I'd like to make a few comments about what I saw. I felt that 
many of the sites failed to convey the seriousness of the problem and that um, in some cases the public needs to go through two or three pages before going, getting to suggestions and descriptions of the seriousness of the problem. And a lot of times when you mention you're aiming for a percentage decrease, you don't say percentage of what, it's not really explained. Um, there is need for some kind of header about the seriousness of the issue and how people can get information if it's not on the first page. Um, not in all cases, but in several cases. And I don't want to call out specific um, uh, entities at this point, but you know who you are and, and there are a lot of sites that are, have best room for improvement. Um, Mandatory doesn't mean much if you don't talk about some penalties. Um, lots of carrots and very few sticks in most cases. Uh, generally, the larger cities have um, better information and are better organized, which maybe is to be expected. But I would suggest that if the smaller entities aren't able to do a very sophisticated layout. They might have good links to those sites that are more informative. And that's pretty much it. Those are my suggestions and comments. And I, I just plead with you to understand the river is about six inches deep at Monorio. You look at it from the bridge, and it looks like there's lots of water there, but then you look at people and dogs in the water and it barely comes up to their ankles. So things are very serious. We're definitely running out of water and there's concerns about what will happen if we don't get a lot of rain this winter. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that, Brenda. And uh, we have, uh, many of the uh, TAC members for all the cities on here, and I am sure they will um, take that information to heart and see where they can make improvements. Thank you. Uh, Roberta, are we seeing any other hands at this point? No, we're not seeing any other hands raised. Okay, then we will go ahead and move on. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Everyone has a recap of the May 3rd WACTAC meeting and the minutes. Um, are there any questions or concerns with those from the uh, WAC members? Please raise your hand. I am not seeing any hands. Roberta, are you seeing any? I am not. Okay. So then we will take public comment on item three of the minutes. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And Secretary Perez, are there any live comments about the minutes from May 3rd? There are no raised hands. Thank you for that. Um, then um, Drew, did you receive any um, pre-recorded or written comments? I did not. Okay, then thank you for that. And um, I would be looking for a motion on the minutes. Trust Marin, Jack Baker. Move the minutes. Jim Cameron from Windsor. Or I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Roberta, did you get those? <laughs> I believe Jack, Jack Baker made the motion and Sam Salmon seconded. Thank you. Okay. Then with that, uh, could we have a roll call from the WAC members? Yes. City of Katati? Yes. City of Petaluma? Yes. City of Roner Park? Yes. City of Santa Rosa? Yes. City of Sonoma? Yes. North Marin Water District? Yes. Town of Windsor? Yes. Valley of the Moonwater District?
Yes. Thank you. So that sounds like we have a unanimous vote on the minutes and then we will move on to um, item four and Drew, would you take this item? Yes, thank you, Chair Harvey. Okay, so these, uh, this is for the uh, approval of the TAC meeting minutes for the July 12th meeting. And again, this will be an action item for the TAC members. Um, so again, the agenda or the meeting minutes have been out uh, available for any uh, review or comments. So I'd just like to ask TAC members, do you have any comments in the meeting minutes as presented? I don't see anybody raising their hand. So I'll go ahead and open this up for public comments. Again, this is agenda item number four, uh, the July 12th TAC meeting minutes. Um, if you have any comments on those meeting minutes, Please raise your hand via Zoom, or if you're ca calling in, press star nine on your phone. I'm seeing I'm not raised hands seeing. on this item. Uh, Gina, you said you were, there are no raised hands on this item? That's correct. Okay, great. And then let the meeting minutes reflect that there are no pre-recorded public comments on this item. So I'll bring it back to the TAC uh, for a motion in a second. Matt Fulner, Valley Moon Water District. I'll make a motion to approve. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water, second. Uh, it's been motion made by Valley of the Moon, seconded by Santa Rosa to approve the meeting minutes as presented. Uh, let's see, Roberta, would you do a roll call, please? Yes. City of Katati. Craig Scott, Katati, yes. City of Petaluma. Kent Carruthers, City of Petaluma, yes. City of Roner Park. City of Santa Rosa. Jennifer Burke, Santa Rosa Water, yes. City of Sonoma. Colleen Ferguson, City of Sonoma, yes. North Marin Water District. Drew McIntyre, North Marin Water District, yes. Town of Windsor. Christina Goulart, Town of Windsor, yes. Valley of the Moon Water District. Matt Holner, Valley of the Moon Water District, yes. Okay, uh, meeting minutes are unanimously approved. So I'll turn it back over to you, uh, Chair Harvey, for agenda item number five. Okay, uh, the Water Supply Coordination Council met on July 19th. Unfortunately, I was not able to attend that meeting, but the result is this agenda. Um, I'm not sure, Drew, if you'd like to add anything to that since I wasn't there. No, I think um, we're going to cover the items that we discussed uh, as they were essentially um, added to this agenda item. So I think that will take care of it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so now we will take public comments on the item five. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And then Secretary Perez, are there any live comments? I'm not seeing any raised hands. Okay, there are no live comments for item five. And um, Drew, did you receive any written or verbal comments? I did not receive any pre-recorded public comments. Okay, thank you for that. Then we will move on to item number six, which is the water supply conditions and temporary urgency change order. And I believe that Don Seymour, you're going to cover this for us. <clears throat> yes, I am. Good, good morning, Chair Harvey and members of the TAC and WAC. So um, starting with the upper part of the watershed, um, Lake Mendocino is currently right at about 24,800 acre feet, which is 22% of the water, water supply pool for this time of year. And the current release is 115 CFS coming out of the reservoir, and that's to meet a minimum stream flow requirement down at Healdsburg of 25 CFS. Um, as many of you probably might be aware, the um, storage threshold that was set in the emergency regulation for August 1st, um, the reservoir dropped below that um, last week. So that activates or it, it, it activates the, um, the emergency regulations um, 
Division Water Rights will start moving forward with all the actions that are authorized under the emergency regulation. Um, so that means curtailment notices will go out to everybody on the Upper Russian River, basically telling them that the, the only reasonable use of, of water on the Upper Russian River is to meet human health and safety needs and minimum stream flow requirements. Um, it does still allow uh, the Mendocino County Flight Control District to continue, uh, the, their, their, their contractors to continue diverting for both agricultural and, and, and municipal needs also. Um, on, on the Lower Russian River, it's being handled a little bit differently. Um, they've done a water availability analysis and <clears throat> they will be issuing, based on priority of, of, of a permittee's water right, uh, issuing curtailments uh, for folks if, if, if water is not available. So th those notices will likely be going out in the next week or so. Um, I just want to point out, um, you know, um, remind everybody that we had Sonoma Water really had had a goal. We were working with the state board staff of ma ma maintaining a storage of 20,000 acre feet um, as of October 1. Um, we're observing reach losses that are that are much higher than 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 would be um, than we can't uh, reach losses that are occurring that are resulting in these necessary high releases that are really um, taxing the reservoir. Lake Mendocino right now will likely be well below 20,000 acre feet on September 1, let alone on October 1, and and if the projection keeps going out, we'll see a, a storage level of less than 12,000 acre feet in Lake Mendocino. Um, on October 1. So these numbers are really concerning. We're really not seeing the reductions that are necessary to uh, maintain storage. Um, I think we can only hope that the, the actions taken by the state board will have a bit more of a bite and, and, and we'll see some uh, relief and be able to reduce our releases. But right now, things are looking pretty dire on the Upper Russian River. For Lake Sonoma, the current storage is um, just over 122,000 acre feet. That's that's just under 50% of the of the water supply pool for the reservoir. Um, it's really tracking um, uh, exactly on the projection we had made based on um, reducing the minimum stream flow requirement uh, down to 35 CFS uh, on the Lower Russian River, and um, the contractors meeting that 20% reduction in diversions from the Rus from the Russian River. So. That res you know, we're really on track on what we hope to accomplish. Um, however, if things remain dry, the reservoir will likely drop below 100,000 acre feet sometime in, in November if we don't see some early rains. Um, and, and when I and I say when I talk when we start thinking about the precipitation that's going to be necessary to see significant runoff, it, generally in a normal year we have to see six to seven inches of precipitation before we start seeing noticeable runoff. And after two plus, you know two years of drought right now that number is probably much higher. We're probably talking eight to 10 inches of, of precipitation um, before we're gonna start seeing some significant natural flow in the system and, and run off into the reservoirs. Um, so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, with that, are there any questions from any of the WACR TAC members? I am not seeing any hands from the WAC or TAC. So then we will now take public comments on item six. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And Secretary Perez, it looks like there's one hand out there. That's correct. Um, I'm going to allow um, Ms. Edelman to speak. Okay, thank you. Yes, Brenda. Okay, thank you. Um, I have one question, and that is, I was looking at the yearly water sales for the contractors, and I would like to know why the most recently year showed a significant greater amount of water sales than the year before. I don't have the number right in front of me, but it well, was. I'd be happy to try to take a shot at that. And maybe um, Pamela you, and Ellie would, would like to chime in. But um, so um, a few of the contractors were, were, when there was still natural flow in the system, were taking greater amounts of water. 
when, you know, when it wouldn't impact Lake Sonoma. And so, for example, Roanoke Park was taking greater water and not leaning on their local groundwater supplies and then have cut way back on Russian River, you know, uh, their, 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 their needs for Russian River water and now are leaning on, on the groundwater supply. So there was a strategy, some, some folks had a strategy of, of using water when it was available, when it wouldn't impact Lake Sonoma. And in addition, you know, we're in the second year of a really dry year. So um, there was probably some greater water use due to in, in earlier in the spring to, for, for landscape irrigation. May I say one thing quickly? Um, yes, Brenda. That, that, that doesn't indicate to me that there's a serious attempt to save water. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I am not seeing any other hands. Gina or Roberta, are you seeing any? There are no other hands raised. There are no other hands, okay. Um, thank you for that. Um, we'll just continue to keep working with folks and, and hope that we get rain. That's really at this point, uh, we're kind of at the mercy of nature and we will continue moving forward with um, trying to impress upon folks that they need to conserve and help them with those efforts. Um, Drew, did you have any um, written or verbal comments on this item? I did not. I did not, okay. Then we will move on to the Snowmarin Savings Partnership. And Drew, are you going to take this? Yes, I am, Chair Harvey. So uh, I'll be handling, just coordinating the next um, this is agenda item seven, so there are three parts to it, seven A, B, and C. I'll start off with seven A first, which is our regular uh, Sonoma River and Saving Water Partnership tracking um, and related overall, you know, total water deliveries related to the 2013 benchmark. You can see for the month of June, uh, the uh, overall water usage is down 23%, and then, um, one thing I would like to point out is in the chart, if if uh, you can just scroll down, Gina or Roberta, yeah, chart one. Just look at the the blue is is the, this year's actual deliveries. The gray was um, again the 2013 base year. You can see there just in the months of April, May, and June, just how the deliveries have been pretty flat. Uh, as we transition from the um, low water demand periods to to high summer demand, so you could you could see that the contractors as a group, you know, are uh, in fact having it. The message is getting out. Um, customers are reducing their their outside water use and conserving. Um, so I and just scroll down to chart two. This is, again, just looking at historical water use since 1995 from a comparison just to show that uh, overall water use is, is much lower, um, not only in looking at 2013, but going back uh, even greater reduction of percentages compared to 1995. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and just open it up to the WAC first to see if there's any questions at all on this on summation of water use. An attack. Uh, Mike Healy, I see you have a question raised. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just curious, remind me why we're using 2013 as a benchmark as opposed to a more recent year. That seems to be a rather low bar. Um, we're, we're actually, good question, uh, Mr. Healy. We're actually just starting to transition with these reports so that we will sync, we will also report based upon our temporary emergency change order that's, that's effective July 1. So the agency will not actually have uh, the actual data in, in until you know, the meters are all read in, in total this week. So uh, the next month is when we'll start having that data. 
uh, reported and tracking on the for the order. I do have when we get to agenda item 7B, I do have some initial reporting on that as well. Any other questions on this agenda item? On the Drew, this is Susan. No, no question, but really just a comment. I, I know it comes up often um, about population growth and it is interesting to note in your chart too that while the population growth um, has continued to rise, um, even with that growth in population, the water usage um, is still running a lot lower. So typically you would, uh, a lot of comments are made about population growth and um, new population coming on seems to be doing their fair share in um, ensuring that we can serve water. Good point, Chair Harvey. Any other questions from the WAC or TAC? Drew, this is uh, Paul Piazza at Sonoma Water. I was hoping just to provide uh, one other clarification for Mr. Healy's question. Yes. I uh, just wanted to um, respond that the 2013 benchmark was actually um, selected by the State Water Resources Control Board during the last drought and is still a metric that they're um, referring to in the monthly conservation reports that all of our um, partners are required to report on uh, to the State Board each month. Um, you recall that uh, in early July, the governor uh, issued an executive order calling for a voluntary 15% reduction in water use statewide. And uh, it's likely that the benchmark for that monthly reporting will get retargeted to meet that 15% reduction goal and could change again too, uh, the further we get into the summer. But it was just to clarify that, that that benchmark was set by the state for us and continues to be the metric that they require us to report towards uh, for our monthly conservation reporting. Thank you, Paul. Any other questions, comments from the WAC or TAC? This is on agenda item 7A. Okay, we'll move it, we'll open this up now for public comment. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand, or if you're participating via telephone, dial star nine. I'm not seeing any raised hands for this item. Thank you, Gina. And let the uh, meeting minutes reflect that there are no pre-recorded comments on this agenda item as well. So let's move on to agenda item number 7B. And this, this is um, directly uh, in an effort to address uh, Supervisor or Council Member Healy's comments just as far as how, how are we doing with respect to the temporary emergency change order. Uh, as I indicated earlier that uh, we'll have some more uh, actual definitive reporting uh, once uh, the monthly records are tallied up. But this is just showing what the agency is tracking just with some uh, process meters that they, that they have through the system. It's not on actual billing data yet that that will occur just um, right around the beginning of August. But it's showing here that uh, our 2020 diversions there in the, in the yellow line, and then the actual since July 1 diversions of this year, and shows that right now the percent reduction is is 24%. Uh, so we're, look, we're meeting and exceeding the 20% uh, order requirements, and we'll continue to track that, obviously, as we as we go through the summer, and we'll we'll have that in monthly reporting uh, to the to the TAC and the WAC uh, moving forward. Any questions from the WAC or TAC on this? Okay, I'll move it up open to the, the public. Any comments from the public? If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand or dial star nine. I'm 
from not seeing any raised hands for this item. Thank you, Secretary Perez, and let the meeting minutes reflect that there are no pre-recorded public comments on agenda item 7B as well. So that'll take us to agenda seven, agenda seven C, which is uh, uh, update on our drought outreach messaging and temporary emergency change order reporting. Paul Piazza is going to provide this report. Paul. Great, thank you, Drew. So the partnership outreach is continuing. Um, we've had a very successful event that uh, occurred on June 12th, which was the regional drought drop by event. There is one correction here, uh, mentions 10,000 drought kits. That's uh, just an error on my part. We were, were ordering 10,000 additional and that number was in my head. So it was 5,300 roughly drought kits that were distributed through the partnership and an additional uh, 750 kits that were funded through Sonoma Water, uh, about 500 of which were distributed to the Ukiah area for the Upper Russian River and uh, about 250 for Forestville Water District for Lower River customers. So a little over uh, 6,000 all told for that event. Uh, the drought kits included um, water saving devices, shower heads, faucet aerators, uh, self-closing hose nozzles, and then additional uh, tools such as toilet leak detection dye tablets and shower timers to help people uh, both achieve direct water savings, but also uh, included a good deal of information about uh, tips to help people save. Uh, as I mentioned, we're, we're planning a, another couple of these drop-by events uh, for August 21st and uh, again in October 9th. Um, the August 21st event will be similar in approach. It'll be offered through Marin, Sonoma, and Mendocino counties, um, essentially all the same agencies that participated in the June 12th event. And then the October 9th event will be uh, just a little bit more limited in scope. Um, we got a lot of good press. Uh, press release uh, led to some television coverage of that event. Um, we also had a lot of community groups that helped support the distribution of the kits and were um, also taking uh, video of those uh, events at the day of and posting them to their agency sites. So a lot of good coverage and information was shared uh, throughout the region on the need to serve, uh, conserve water. Um, the partnership has also launched um, a Saving Water Challenge, another opportunity for folks to become uh, greater aware and to find information on ways to save. Uh, on the partnership's website, there's uh, a series of water saving tips provided and then um, a, a great list of prizes that we're offering for those that are willing to take a pledge to save water. Um, that event was envisioned to run through the end of July and we're in discussion to extend that potentially uh, throughout the summer just to continue to um, drive folks to that website and information, um, recognizing that uh, that's a great great way to get people uh, encouraged and interested in, in saving water this summer. Uh, we have a number of other outreach um, projects that we're working on. We have a trusted messenger video project that's very close to launch. The filming of those um, videos is now complete and in the editing phase, which features um, a list of um, community members and others from throughout the area that have businesses or are champions at saving water and um, are willing to go on record to talk about what they're doing with their businesses and at their homes uh, to encourage folks uh, to meet these savings goals. And those are um, bilingual, um, Spanish and English, similar to uh, all the information that we're pushing out to the community. Uh, we're also going uh, to the Sonoma County Fair Summer Fun Fest with some marketing. Uh, for the drought outreach, including we have lawn signs throughout the site, and then we have uh, water saving tips information uh, throughout the, the restroom facilities at the fair. So the uh, the Summer Fun Fest is kind of fair light. It's running from 
now through August 8th. Um, so we're hoping that will generate some additional outreach opportunity for the partnership. Um, we have a significant amount of lawn signs that have been distributed that include the drought is here, save water message. Uh, those have gone out to the partners that uh, wish to receive them and we're making them available to the public as interest um, comes to us. Uh, so that's another opportunity to get the message out. Uh, and then shifting on to the temporary urgency change order. Uh, this is in regard to the term nine that was included in the previous order, um, which required monthly water conservation reports to the state board. Uh, we just submitted uh, as of October 1st, the fifth uh, report of that term. Uh, there is a final report due at the end of this month, August, um, that we'll be reaching out to the partnership to um, coalesce the final reporting metrics for that. To date, uh, the term of the order savings due to the outreach activities or the rather the programmatic savings metrics is about 14 and a half million gallons. Um, and just to clarify again, that's just for the term of the order. So uh, roughly five months into the six month term for this reporting period. Um, and then I wanted to make sure to um, share some pictures of some of the work that's been done by the partnership, uh, which was included in this um, attachment. Um, this is of the June 12th uh, drop, drop by event. Hopefully you've had a chance to go through some of these. I'm not gonna take the time to run through all of them. Um, there's a few examples of some of the outreach messaging that is occurring for the, the current Saving Water Challenge and then um, a significant amount of pictures that show uh, the level of effort that was um, put together by staff, both here at Sonoma Water and throughout uh, the partnership agencies to um, pull together what was a, a pretty amazing event. Um, just the materials procurement alone um, is a concerted effort. It takes staff um, assembling into a location um, where our partners can uh, easily access it. Um, staff time to break out um, the bulk purchased order into allocations so that when our partners do arrive at the site, uh, it makes it easy for them um, to load up and head back to their, their uh, agency. Um, there was uh, not only the materials itself, but staffing needs by all the partners on the day of uh, for that, we had directional signage that had to be created and banners. Um, here's a, a little example of what was in the kit. And then after a number of days of work to get ready and stage, um, the day of the event was very successful at Santa Rosa, uh, the exit off of 12 leading to the fairgrounds where this picture is, um, was a line um, that went all the way back to the freeway exit. Uh, they had um, their whole staff and a bunch of volunteers set up um, where they could handle three to four cars at a time. And they went through all of their materials that day. Uh, this is just a picture of the city of Katadi outside their offices. We can go ahead and continue to scroll through these quickly. Um, but at the city of Soma Plaza, um, they had people showing up right at about 7.30 or 7.45 a.m. and raring to pick up kits. North Marin was a very busy morning. I happened to stop by that morning and they had uh, a line of cars um, for several hours working through their turnaround and keeping their staff of five or six very busy. Uh, fortunately, the train schedule was very light that day, so people having to navigate in and out of the site had an easy go of it. Uh, Lucchese Center in Petaluma, um, Chelsea and Danielle did a great job with a busy morning. I did stop by there um, also to help out for a, a brief while. Um, we had some interesting folks show up. As you know, we went with a the theme of a drop by rather than a drive up to try and encourage folks to take alternate modes of transportation. So this is an example of one of those. Valley of the Moon Water District had a site on Sonoma Valley at their corporation yard. Um, they also sold out of all of their kits that morning. 
similarly with the town of Windsor, I think they distributed all but four of their kits. They were across from Windsor High School at their corporation yard. A lot of positive comments coming from staff there about people really appreciative of the effort to provide opportunities for them to save at their home. You had Forest Hill Water District participating as well up at El Molino High School. I think this picture was taken bright and early. They did get very busy later in the day and did go through all of their kits as well. City of Cloverdale was our newest member of the partnership as of the 1st of July. Had a great turnout up in their area. So they were set up on their plaza where they host the Friday night music. And they had some help from our Skype staff here at Sonoma County as well to distribute kits up there. And then, of course, a couple sites up in the Ukiah area to support some of the work that the Mendocino County Russian River Flood Control and Water Conservation District is doing. And lastly, Marin style, if you weren't showing up in a bright, shiny Ferrari, you were turned away that morning as unworthy. In any case, there was, again, news coverage. I know you can't see the link, the way these news links work. Often when you click on them a few days after the event, they kind of get buried in the background due to current events. But there was great news coverage on KPX and also some community event videos that were shared widely on their Facebook pages. So all in all, just want to say thanks to all the many hands that went into making this a successful day. And also to look forward to a similar successful event in August 21st and later in October. So that's it for me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I think we're all looking forward to our next event and expect that there'll be similar, similar interest. And I think we all are a little bit better prepared with supplies to try to make sure we don't run out. So any questions from the WAC or the TAC on Paul's presentation? This is agenda item 7C. I don't see any questions from the WAC or TAC, so I'll open this up to public comment. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand, or if you're participating via phone, dial star 9. I do not see any raised hands for this item. Thank you, Secretary Perez. Let the meeting minutes reflect that there were no pre-recorded public comments on this agenda item as well. Okay, Chair Harvey, the next item, I'll turn it back over to you for controlling the agenda here, but it is a report by me just on the water shortage allocation methodology. So I'll go ahead and start on that if you're okay. Yes, I just would like to make one comment. I want to thank Paul for that wonderful presentation. And I want to thank all of the folks that helped with those events. I heard from quite a few people that they were very grateful to receive those items. And I know that it takes a lot of work to put on those kind of events. So the work is extremely well appreciated by all. So thank you for that. And with that, we can move on to the item 8, water storage allocation methodology update. And you're on, Drew. Thank you. If the WAC will recall, back in April, we had a similar update on just the water shortage allocation methodology. Again, just want to reiterate that the agency does have an allocation model in place. Unfortunately, it's old. It was adopted in 2006. It doesn't have features that we've been trying to include in an updated allocation methodology. Back in 2014, the WAC did approve an updated allocation methodology. It included provisions for addressing local supplies. It was better 
established or set up to determine monthly allocations rather than annual allocations. It had an out, it had an allotment for fire uh, flows for all the contractors. It also had um, a water loss um, allocation as well. So, so various improvements. Um, the 2014 allocation model did sunset in 2016. Uh, and we've been trying to work uh, since that time to have a unanimously approved allocation model uh, submitted by the WAC that would replace the agency's John Nelson 2006 model for use. Uh, we have been working since the April 8th or April 5th update to the WAC, we being the tech members and agency staff on the allocation model, trying to answer some additional questions that, that uh, individual water contractors have. Uh, we had hoped to bring um, a updated model to this meeting for approval, but we're not there yet. We're, we're close, we're continuing to work uh, collaboratively. And so what, what the TAC leadership is requesting right now is is that we have a special WAC meeting uh, added to our regularly scheduled September 13th TAC meeting uh, with the hopes that we could have an agenda item then in September on uh, uh, voting to approve a, a um, water shortage allocation methodology that would be unanimous by the water contractors. So again, we're getting there, but we need some more time. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that the WAC or TAC has on this item. I don't see any hands being raised. Nor do I, Drew. So Chair Harvey, you could go ahead and open it up for public comment. Okay. Then uh, we are now taking public comment on item eight. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Uh, Secretary Perez, are there any comments from the public? I am not seeing any hands. Nor am I. Okay, then I will bring it back. And Drew, do we have any um, verbal or written pre-recorded public comments? We do not. Okay, well, thank you very much for that information and um, looks like everybody should be penciling in September 13th for a special meeting um, for that. Uh, and we will, with that, we will move on to item nine, the Santa Rosa Plain Drought Resiliency Project. And I'm not sure whether Grant or Jay is going to take this, so. I'll let you two duke it out. <laughs> no need to duke it out. Good morning, Chair. <laughs> I, uh, I'm covering this for Jay, who is up, okay. uh, not able to join today. But Jay put a rather exhaustive uh, memo together to Drew in preparation for the WAC meeting. And so anything I don't cover here is will be uh, in that memo, plus the draft Q&A that was provided. So... Uh, I'll not, not go into great detail on this because most members have been aware of what it's taken to get to this point. But essentially back in May, um, led by uh, Director Rabbit, we were able to secure uh, about $400,000 from the County of Sonoma in order to uh, investigate bringing in, uh, bringing online uh, a Todd Road uh, old production well that was built in the last uh, major drought in 76, 77, um, the entire effort is well underway. Uh, we've taken the direction from the board and been able to secure uh, Gelati Construction to move forward on this well. Uh, it's it's uh, going very smoothly. Uh, Jay's been leading up a team throughout the, the uh, water agency of um, planners. Um, Wendy and Kent primarily on, his, on, on behalf of the agency have been putting these together. But essentially, come early September, we're online to bring a, a well back uh, that will meet public drinking standards. Uh, 
hundred thousand gallons a day that will be used primarily to ensure that the city of Petaluma is able to respond in a coordinated manner on the livestock needs that are uh, been well well reported. It's important to note, though, that um, allowing to meet that legitimate need, uh, there is going to be additional water made available for uh, helping to meet the mandate that we have under our temporary urgency change order. So that's making sure that we as uh, contractors and as an agency are able to reduce our usage by 20% diversion out of the Russian River, which so far You've heard earlier, we're well on our way. We're about 24% reduced diversions over last year. So please report that. I guess what I'd like to focus on quickly is just the importance. There are three uh, wells that were brought online during the 76, 77 drought. They have been run uh, during times of need and we've needed to build a chlorine contact uh, process to bring this up to compliance. And that is what we're hard at work um, carrying out. The materials, uh, the large 36-inch uh, pipe have been brought onto both sites, uh, not just the Todd Road well, but also the Sebastopol Road, road uh, site. And that is because we're hoping long-term, once phase one, which is this ultimate 200,000 to 500,000 delivery comes online in September, we'll be able to also be well enough along with uh, plans and designs to seek competitively uh, drought funding from the state of California in order to put one of those wells or, or a couple potentially into a active recharge uh, component. So uh, that will take funding from the state and collectively uh, are securing those funds. But the idea is to uh, replace what's been taken out of the Santa Rosa Plain wells and create a uh, recharge opportunity that will actually improve the groundwater sustainability of the Santa Rosa Plain and create an opportunity for us to be doing active conjunctive use and management for aqua storage and recharge. So uh, that's a high priority for us. I think as a region, it's gonna make us more secure, more resilient. Uh, these wells have been activated before, but now that we're building the, uh, the, the chlorination component, uh, we're hoping that they'll actively work for uh, the future and we'll be successful in getting uh, state funding to help uh, achieve that. So I want to definitely uh, thank staff. I also want to thank leadership uh, director rabbit for securing these funds from the County. I think it's safe to say that I can't recall the last time we've secured that type of funding from the County for just about anything to Sonoma water. It's usually the reverse where we're actually uh, helping contribute toward other County objectives. So with that, I think I will just allow the memo to uh, speak for itself and thank staff and contractors for helping us facilitate getting this online. Thank you for that grant. Um, Wacker TAC members, do you have any questions about this report? Please raise your hand. Chair Harvey. Yes, would you um, like to speak? <laughs> Yes, I, I would like to just, again, uh, follow up with some of the things that Grant said. Um, for the group, if you're not aware, you know, that these groundwater production wells, as Grant had indicated, you know, had, had been part of their water supply portfolio for many years and had been used regularly in, in earlier droughts, uh, going back through the the records that I see to the tune of about four to five million gallons per day. So I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, these wells um, moving forward to become active again. And, and an important part this time around, uh, again, is I just want to reiterate is that uh, Grant's comments is looking at um, not only being able to pump the groundwater out, but actually put surplus water back in, um, which is part of the aquifer storage and recovery or conjunctive use, which is a big plus uh, this go around with with uh, activating the well. So all in all, a, a really important project. And I think from a from a groundwater sustainability uh, element too is is uh, improved with the efforts with the recharge and recovery component. So I just wanted to just reiterate those components. 
Thank you for that, Drew. Yes, I concur. I think that that's going to be very helpful to us with our other um, uh, groundwater sustainability uh, efforts. So I'm glad to see that that water will hopefully work going both ways. So I think that's a great use. So with that, um, I am not. Oh, are there? Is there another hand here? I'm, Rabbit. <laughs> yes. Oh, thank you very much. I just want to say again, thank you to all the staff that has been working on this. Jay Jasper has been doing a great job as usual, uh, but to Grant for your support, very much appreciated. I think it's uh, obviously, um, you know, we're all in this together in the drought, um, making sure that we have a plan going forward uh, is an important aspect uh, to make sure that that water is delivered, especially to the, uh, the vital economic engines that both really both Western uh, Marin and West Sonoma have. Uh, to that extent, I've been meeting uh, a couple times now. Uh, we've had uh, morning Zoom meetings with uh, Dennis Redoni, Supervisor uh, Marin County to coordinate efforts, make sure that we're staying on top of things uh, working forward. And I appreciate Drew and uh, Grant for joining those as well. Um, this, I, I do think that there's additional benefit as we go forward and uh, as we move into the implementation of all their all of our uh, GSAs in terms of uh, groundwater um, uh, banking, uh, that this investment in this way um, can help us get further along that path uh, in a quicker manner. So very much appreciated uh, of everyone's support on this project uh, and uh, just wanted to make sure that you all knew that once again. So thank you. Thank you for that, David. I absolutely agree. We're all in this, whether it's a drought or whether we have water that we need to bank in the future. We've got to um, make sure that we have a sustainable water supply. So glad to see that we're working at it from multiple ends. So any other Wacker Tech comments? David, is that a residual hand you have up still? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that, um, we if there are no other Wacker Tech comments, I will open this up for public comment on item nine. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you are dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Uh, Secretary Perez, do we have any public comment? I am not seeing any hands. I don't see any raised hands. Okay, then I will bring it back. Drew, did we have any written or verbal comments on this item? We did not. We did not. Okay, well, thank you for that. And thank you for the wonderful information. And thank you, Grant, for um, taking that item for us while Jay is out and about. Um, then we will move on to item 10, the biological opinion status update. And I believe that Pam Jean is going to take this for us, Pam. I am. Um, um, thank you and thank you whoever just put the, the update up. Hopefully everybody has seen the report that was included with your agenda for today. Um, I'm gonna briefly go through it, try to hit the highlights and things that have changed since I last reported to you. Um, so um, starting at the top with the fish flow project, there really are no changes here. We continue to do a lot of modeling work um, to get us to the point where we have a, 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 a new draft of the EIR to um, have our board consider. So um, that's where we're at right now. On the Dry Creek Habitat Enhancement Project, which is the next item down, we do have some construction going on this summer. Hanford ARC, who has um, been our contractor on a, a several of these reaches of our projects, is out there again this summer um, working on phase three project elements. Um, they have a couple of pieces of the project, both on the west side and the east side of the creek, that are moving forward. Um, they've essentially already completed um, a portion of the project on the west side of the creek, which is a backwater feature. And now they're working on the east side of the creek. Um, and there's a, a, a good description in here of, of how they're going to go about that work. They do expect to complete construction of this last piece of um, this phase of the project, phase three of the project um, in about September or so. 
and be out of the creek by the uh, deadline of October 15th, um, which is what our permits allow. Um, there is a photograph um, that's on the screen right now, although it is hard to see. Um, we were pleased uh, to see that uh, one of our bank repair projects, um, a family of foxes decided to create a den in that um, space. So um, this is a bank repair project that was done in 2020. So um, it's nice to see the habitats, you know, it wasn't really intended for this, um, but nonetheless, um, the bank repair uh, has provided some habitat for some uh, land-based um, animals for us too. Um, habitat monitoring and maintenance. Um, our environmental staff continues to do physical and biological um, surveys on constructed projects out there in order to quantify habitat areas and identify um, needs for maintenance and changes um, to the projects. There's a nice description in here of what it is that they're doing, but um, sort of bottom line is that uh, monitoring in 2020 indicated that the greatest amount of habitat or optimal habitat is in the off-channel um, enhancement sites that they've been um, installing and in alcove habitat units. So these are not in the main portion of the channel, the flowing portion of the channel, but kind of off to the side which I think was um, expected. So um, phase three of um, the sites uh, below West Side Bridge um, that we had some issues with deposition um, in 2019 um, are um, being worked on and there's some concepts that are um, being worked on in order to provide a design and uh, hopefully get out there in 2022 to repair um, the deposition issue that we've had out in these, in these locations. Um, and we also um, will be funding that work um, through the same funding mechanism for phases two and three, um, which is the Warm Springs Dam Fund. So, um, phases four through six, um, Interflu has completed the bid documents for phase four. Uh, that'll be the first phase that gets constructed and um, by the Corps of Engineers. And they're still working on right-of-way agreements and some changes that have been requested by property owners. Um, and due to the time associated with that relook at those um, right-of-way agreements, um, we don't expect to get out there. Well, we're not going to get out there this summer for construction, um, but we do expect to be out there next year in 2022. Um, ESA has completed the 99% design for phase five of the construction work, which is scheduled to begin in 2023. And we continue to advance right-of-way agreements, working with owners, um, and addressing comments, of course, on the right of way, similar comments to what we've had um, on the phase four work. Um, phase six of the project is also um, at a 99% design phase, and that project would start construction in 2024. And again, the right of way work is, is one of the hardest things and the thing that's being worked on the most at this point. Um, ESA, who uh, worked on phases three and five for us, is also um, looking at a site immediately upstream of a phase three site. They have about a 30% design package um, ready for that. Um, and this uh, is being done, this work is being done in case we need um, a bit more mileage, so to speak. Um, to fully meet our six mile requirement associated with the biological opinion. So um, there's a, a description here of, of what it is that they're doing there if anybody wants to read it. Um, as far as fish monitoring goes, we do have a lot of work going on with regards to fish monitoring this summer because of the drought. And we've undertaken a lot of monitoring associated with um, how the, the change this year in flows is impacting fish populations as well as their habitat in the main stem and in the estuary. 
Um, there's also related water quality monitoring, both in the Russian River and in Lake Mendocino. So collectively, we're monitoring fish populations at five sites. We have water quality monitoring going on at 23 sites and physical conditions or habitat, fish habitat um, condition monitoring going on at eight sites this summer. Um, we, have, we do have a number of locations where we have um, real-time monitoring going on, in other words, cons constant monitoring going on using data sonds, as well as we do some grab sampling associated with these. And the physical monitoring is conducted bi-weekly. Um, all of this information is being collected and reported to the resource agencies weekly. And um, hopefully folks have found that information on our website. Um, it tends to be located at our www.sonomawater.org slash TUCP, which stands for Temporary Urgency Change Petition. So um, folks should be able to find that information there. As far as the Russian River Estuary Management Project goes, the mouth of the river is open at this point. Um, we are doing baseline weekly pinniped monitoring and water quality and biological monitoring as we normally do at this time of year. And again, that water quality monitoring data can be viewed at that site that I just um, spoke to, and it's listed here on the document if uh, folks want to go there. And Don already spoke about interim, interim flow changes, so I will not repeat what he said. And I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you for that very thorough report, Pam. A lot Welcome. of stuff is going on. Uh, any of the Wacker TAC have any questions on this report? I am not Chair seeing Harvey. it. Chair yes, Harvey. Yes, Drew. I see your hand. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Pam. Uh, just a quick question, Pam, related to the sediment buildup uh, on the habitat monitoring and maintenance report. Uh, you talked about the west side road bridge that there is still some sediment uh, deposits there that need to continue to be worked on. Was that area last summer? Was that area worked on, and it's just kind of an ongoing thing for for uh, multiple years, or was this an area that wasn't looked at last summer? Yeah, I don't think we fully addressed it last summer. Um, so this is sort of out, an outstanding um, maintenance issue right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was that was my only question. Thank you for that. Any other questions for Pam? I am not seeing any other hands, so I will open this up to public comment on item 10. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. Um, Gina, are we, or Roberta, are we seeing any hands? I do not. I'm not seeing any raised hands for this item. Thank you for that. And Drew, did we have any written or verbal comments received? We did not. We did not. Okay. So then thank you again, Pam, for the very thorough report. And um, I particularly love seeing that um, we have additional habitat for <laughs> other critters. I think that's Unintended pretty awesome. Habitat. <laughs> that's all right. You know, sometimes it that works. happens. Yeah, it works. Yeah. So with that, we will move on to item 11, the Potter Valley Project relicensing update. And I think Pam, you're on for this one also. Yep, that's me too. And Grant, feel free to um, chime in if I miss something. Um, so we have um, the partnership for the Potter Valley Project um, relicensing is, has um, a due date in mid-September for a filing with FERC. Um, we are not going to probably be filing what's due um, in accordance with that filing schedule that we have, but we are going to be filing something, and we are working on that filing right now. So um, the partners are, are working together to get, that, to get that done and make sure that we get to our boards in time and get to FERC by mid-September. 
Um, so there's um, some negotiation going on with regards to what that filing is going to look like at this point. Um, I also wanted to mention, though, um, with regards to actual operation of the Potter Valley project, um, that the project continues to operate under a variance that was issued because of the drought um, for the project this year. And that um, order, uh, that variance order runs out, um, I'm trying to remember the exact date, and I don't remember exactly, it's early August, so within the next couple of weeks. Um, and it's not clear what FERC is going to do in association with that. So um, we're not sure what's going to happen, um, whether they're going to go back to their normal operational mode or if um, a variance is going to, the variance is going to be extended. It's already been extended once, um, but um, hasn't, they, we haven't heard yet exactly what they're going to do. So um, anyways, I just wanted to make sure folks were aware of that because that's a, an operational issue this year up there. Um, just as we are dry, they are dry also. So, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Does anyone on the WACR TAC have any questions? Drew, do you have any questions? I do, I do not. <laughs> Oh, gee. Grant, did you um, want to add anything before I open up for public comment? No, I think Pam did a really okay. good job about where we are. I do just want to remind folks, though, that um, Sonoma Water, Pam, and the team have been briefing uh, TAC members throughout this entire process and uh, keeping our electeds up to speed. It, it's definitely entering into a very important time frame with needing to get to FERC by the 14th. So. Uh, as we're going through that, it's never uh, an easy road with this project. So I've appreciated the tax involvement and our efforts to communicate and uh, expect to continue doing that regardless. Thank you, Grant. Yeah, I think it's a little difficult. There's a lot of balls up in the air with, you know, what's going on with the groundwater and the drought and this, and, you know, there's a lot of things up in the air. So it's kind of hard to keep all the balls up in the air. Um, especially since we're dealing with some unprecedented um, times at this point. So with that, um, I will open this up for public comment uh, for, on item 11. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in, please dial star nine. Um, Gina, I am not seeing any hands, are you? I don't see any raised hands. Okay. So since there's no more public comment, I will bring it back. Um, Drew, do you have any written or verbal comments that you received? There were no pre-recorded comments. Okay. Thank you for that. And we will move on to the next item, the Sonoma County Water Agency Capital Improvement Projects Update, the Inflatable Dam and Railroad Crossing uh, Carlos Diaz, I believe is going to take this item. Yes, thank you, Chair Harvey, and uh, thanks thank to the TAC and WAC members for the opportunity to present today. I'm uh, filling in for um, Kent Gilfie, who, uh, who wasn't able to attend today. Um, here to present a couple of our capital improvement projects occurring along the, the Russian River, primarily at our Wooler Mirabel facilities, ongoing construction this summer. Um, the first project is a seismic reliability project uh, to protect the Russian River Katahdi intertie pipeline um, as it crosses underneath the Russian River. Um, this is not a new project. I believe uh, Kent um, or others from Sonoma Water have, have presented to the committee before on this project. Um, it's, it's been in the works uh, with FEMA now for um, nearly a decade. Um, they and we've been wrestling with environmental and right of way um, and primarily the funding hurdles for years now, uh, finally received uh, notice to um, that, that the project was awarded. We were really able to hit the ground uh, running the complete design last year. So I'll be presenting on that. The second project involves uh, the Mirabel rubber dam um, and replacement of the rubber fabric uh, due to it being at the end of its life. Um, if, if you could go back a couple slides there to slide two. Uh, please, that'd be great. Thank you. 
Um, so here, starting with the Russian River crossing, we have an aerial um, of the, the project area, the Russian River kind of doing its U-turn around our, um, our Mirabel Ponds, um, kind of on the north or the upper left uh, portion of the, uh, the slide. Uh, the green highlighted sections reflect uh, work areas that are currently under construction as part of the Russian River Crossing project. Um, the orange area is a similar project. That's the Mark West Creek Crossing project, and that will be going to construction um, next summer. As I mentioned, the, the main purpose of the Russian River Crossing project is to address, address um, risk of seismically induced liquefaction and lateral spread that could uh, damage that pipeline and, and interfere with our ability to um, provide water. Um, due to um, liquefiable soils um, there in the vicinity of the Russian River. Uh, next slide, please. So here's just a, a couple of, of pictures from the original um, construction. You can see what you know is kind of like a trapezoidal section of pipe um, with the, the, the bottom portion underneath the river and then the, the two side portions coming up um, each bank. Um, what was found uh, through some studies was that um, those those kind of riser portions of the pipe and also um, some of the, the the pipe that's laid more horizontally on either side of the bank were actually in a in a uh, soil horizon um, that was vulnerable to lateral spread, a, a process whereby you know that land would essentially slump into um, the Russian river uh, since there's nothing holding it back. Um, and so we, we found that there was a high potential for that, that pipeline to rupture, that 48 inch aqueduct in those kind of orange sandy uh, layers, which, which tend to um, be more vulnerable to lateral spread. You can see these kind of red lines. I apologize for the um, graininess of the photo, but I'm going to try to speak through it. These, these red lines that kind of extend from the ground surface down into the lower portions of the river are essentially kind of failure planes um, by which we would expect that land to have the potential to, to, to fall into the river. And, and essentially we're trying to get that pipeline, that aqueduct outside of those failure planes. Uh, next slide, please. So here's here's the project essentially in uh, in plan view. Um, we have our Mirabel ponds um, on the left side of the slide. Um, the Reston River kind of coming um, flowing down, if you will. Um, so the project we're replacing and lowering the profile of the aqueduct on either side of the river, uh, approximately 800 feet on the north side of the river or the left side of the. the um, the plan view drawing here and about 500 feet on the south side. Um, somewhat ironically, we're not replacing the pipe that actually crosses under the river, uh, but you know, with that slide I presented to you before, um, that portion underneath the river is not um, found, was not found to be um, susceptible uh, to, to any kind of failure mechanism um, due to uh, seismically induced uh, motions um, in the area. Um, so we're, we're strictly focused on um, getting the, the pipe on both sides of the river um, outside of those failure planes. Next slide, please. Kind of the basis, some of the basis for that determination was um, some finite element analyses, uh, essentially stress and strain modeling uh, that was done on the aqueduct, a very detailed geotechnical assessment, um, kind of really digging into those permanent ground deformation uh, potentials out there in the surrounding soils. Um, these efforts resulted in, in refined determinations of necessary and changing cylinder thicknesses for the steep pipeline. So we were able to actually model, you know, where we needed thicker uh, sections of, of steel aqueduct. Um, and, and one of the other main features that came out of this was this S-curve design on the north side of the river. Um, it's a key element uh, that, that is kind of introducing some additional resiliency uh, for that pipeline to be able to um, accommodate any anticipated um, ground motions in the area. Next slide, please. Digging into the construction a little bit. 
Um, so we issued a notice to proceed in February. Uh, the contractor began mobilizing to the site in mid-May following some RFIs and, and submittals. Um, we did find uh, some challenging uh, nesting birds um, at the project site, um, which delayed initial activities for, for some time. Um, and we have another permit constraint out there, which is working below ordinary high water. Um, we were not allowed to do that prior to June 15th. Um, and so we've been trying to accommodate uh, and work around uh, some of those issues. Essentially, the contractor uh, since May has really been focused on clearing operations. And then there is uh, some considerable mass excavation occurring out there to remove uh, some overburden, uh, particularly on the south side of the aqueduct. We have a very deep uh, uh, pipelines, approximately 40 feet in depth. Uh, and so the contractor has been over excavating approximately 20 feet, laying back those slopes, um, at which point we'll be able to do, you know, more, more traditional kind of trench uh, coupled with some vertical shoring um, to, uh, to conduct the actual pipe installation. Uh, next slide, please. We've also been conducting some potholing activities to confirm the location of the existing pipe. Um, the left picture shows one of the potholes adjacent to the river. Uh, that man standing down there is, is uh, standing on our aqueduct. Um, we did discover through uh, the act of location, locating these pipes that uh, they weren't exactly where we thought they were according to our record drawing. So it appears that that trapezoidal section, our, our best indication is that it might have rolled a little bit during the initial installation back in the 1970s. And so it was offset several feet horizontally um, and a foot or two uh, vertically as well, which which did uh, lead to some kind of rapid redesigns and, and working with the contractor to avoid any further delays. And we've been successful in doing that. Um, we've also been driving sheet piles out at the site for stabilization and water control. There will be several dewatering wells that are installed around uh, those sheet piles um, to allow for uh, ultimate tie-ins um, at the river's edge uh, on both sides of the river. Next slide, please. So just a, a, a quick summary um, of, of the project, as I indicated, uh, in January 2020, FEMA obligated $2.9 million in funding toward the project cost. Uh, you'll see a, a total contract amount of $7.35 million there. Um, that FEMA grant is a three-year process uh, to complete the project, um, along with Mark West Creek project. So those were both um, obligated uh, concurrently. I, I mentioned Mark West Creek project will be advancing to construction next summer. Um, we uh, awarded a contract to Mountain Cascade um, in January of this year. Our board uh, awarded that contract in the amount of $7.35 million. Um, all work adjacent to the river is required to be completed by October 15th uh, under the terms of our permits um, and substantial completions scheduled for mid-December. Um, any delays could potentially change that date, and we're working uh, diligently with the contractor to avoid um, that. Um, we do anticipate some shutdowns as part of the, the tie-ins um, there at the river's edges. We anticipate three shutdowns in total um, along various segments of the project. Um, under the current contract terms, we allow the contractor three days for each shutdown. Um, this is, you know, obviously important to all our water contractors and we'll be working very closely with you. We do not anticipate any service disruption um, as we have um, uh, uh, other pipelines that will be able to continue feeding the aqueduct. Um, though we would advise, uh, you know, water contractors topping off any tanks ahead of each shutdown. Um, those shutdowns had initially been scheduled for early August mid-September and early October, um, given the delays uh, up until now, we've had to reshuffle um, some activities. 
Um, and those dates are still to be determined and we will be providing those with our next schedule updates. I believe we've been um, providing uh, updates at our water contractors operators coordination meeting um, in May, June, and July, and we'll continue communicating on the status of, of the project, and we plan uh, to use that as a forum for, for updating um, on a monthly basis. Um, in addition to those meetings, um, we also intend to communicate uh, specifically to the operators of, of each of the water contractors in advance of scheduled shutdowns um, as part of the daily water production reports. Um, Garrett and our staff is putting um, those out to the water contractor operators uh, due to the ongoing drought that we've been having. So we'll be uh, communicating regularly, uh, both as part of those daily water production reports um, and also as part of the water contractors operators coordination meetings. Next slide, please. So that does it for the Russian River um, Katati Intertie Crossing project. I'm gonna speak now to our inflatable dam fabric replacement project. Uh, the purpose of this project is to replace the armored rubber fabric or bladder um, on our inflatable dam at Maribel. Uh, the inflatable dam serves as a critical part of our production facilities on the river, um, allowing us to divert river flows into our infiltration basins um, and impounding water in the river channel to aid in uh, recharge of groundwater um, from which the collector wells uh, pump water into our transmission system. Next slide, please. So here's, here's some photos of the uh, original construction uh, back in the 1970s. Um, you see on the left there, the foundation of, of the uh, rubber dam itself. Um, and on the right side, actual installation of, of the, the rubber bladder. Um, the fabric was last replaced in 1995 to 1997 um, after approximately 20 years of service. Um, and so we are uh, we're pushing um, about 25 years now um, on, on that project and, and it's, it's due to be replaced. Um, Next slide, please. We identified that need um, as part of a detailed assessment of the fabric that we conducted back in 2016. And as, as part of that assessment, it was determined that uh, the, the existing rubber dam was in fact nearing the end of its useful life and recommended replacement by, by 2021. So we're, uh, we're squeaking, squeaking in there on the, um, one shoulder of that, that replacement recommendation there. Uh, we had hoped to replace it last year in 2020, um, but ended up rejecting uh, bids uh, due to concerns over uh, delivery of the fabric in time with COVID and, and disruptions of, uh, of materials delivery. Um, we did purchase the rubber fabric um, and, and do have that on hand um, now. Um, it was delivered last year. Um, and so that, that's what we'll be uh, advancing here in the, in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, just real brief kind of overview of uh, this plan view that you're seeing on your screen. Uh, you can see the rubber dam extending kind of left to right across the Russian River um, we have our river, uh, uh, our fish ladder um, on, on the uh, left side of the screen, um, along with a couple of coffer dams that are shown um, kind of as, as these squiggly lines. Again, apologize for the uh, lack of clarity here, sort of difficult. I don't know if you guys can actually see my pointer or not. Um, but we have we have a rubber dam essentially. Um, it's like an aqua dam on the on the south side of the river, um, our downstream side of the river, and on the um, upstream north side of the river. It's a sheet pile um, coffer dam that's essentially diverting um, existing Russian River flows uh, through our fish ladder facility, allowing for that work area uh, to be dewatered. Um, and for um, replacement of that, that rubber dam 
uh, to commence. Um, within that uh, dewatered area on the south side of the river, there's also a, a gravel bar um, that has uh, formed over the years and is kind of steering steering flows and um, causing some uh, uh, kind of changes in flow conditions over the rubber dam. So as part of the project, we'll also be uh, removing that that gravel bar and, and vegetation on that gravel bar to um, get more consistent flows across uh, the dam face itself. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a, a section view of, of the dam itself, um, showing it laying on um, its foundation and uh, the anchorage of, of that dam itself uh, to the foundation. Um, the, the, the concrete slab that the dam's sitting on is approximately 20 feet wide. Um, it's, it's also resting on concrete piles for uh, additional structural stability. Uh, the, the rubber dam itself, the water-filled bladder, is approximately 11 feet high uh, when we fully inflate it uh, during dry months um, in order to, uh, you know, recharge that groundwater, aid in the, the production of our um, Wooler facilities and um, recharging those infiltration uh, basins as well. Um, and the rubber dam folds down uh, during, during high flow periods, typically uh, during the winter and, and those shoulder seasons as well. The next slide shows a uh, picture of the dam fabric itself. It's approximately 5 8 inch uh, thick slab of rubber. Um, this is the old fabric, uh, so uh, just to uh, uh, allay any fears there. Um, this is the old fabric. It's approximately 5 8 inches thick. We'll be replacing it with very similar fabric. It's a uh, woven, it has a woven nylon reinforcement um, inside of the rubber and also contains ceramic chips uh, to armor against any vandalism. So um, no switch blades would be able to, to get through that, uh, that fabric due to that ceramic chip um, there. The next slide uh, shows uh, delivery of the fabric um, that we purchased last year. We've been storing that fabric at our Wooler yard for the last several months, um, awaiting construction. Um, and that, that photo is that, that fabric rolled up there and, and being, being hoisted onto um, its, its storage site. Um, Next slide shows some of our um, active construction out there at the site. You can see, um, you know, the contractor mobilized during the month of July um, pre pre in preparation of the removal of the existing dam. They've been installing these coffer dams. I mentioned this aqua dam on the on the downstream side of the river, and you can see um, actually a, a heavy piece of machinery there um, actively. Um, clearing uh, that gravel bar that I had mentioned um, that was forming kind of some uh, an eddy and, and some, uh, some, some hydraulics that we're trying to um, avoid. Um, and on the, uh, the right picture shows the actual that uh, upstream cofferdam, sheet pile cofferdam um, that uh, the crane is, uh, has been installing uh, from the south side of the dam actually across uh, the rubber dam itself. Next slide, please. So the, re the removal of the existing gra gravel bar that's accumulated immediately downstream of the dam uh, highlighted that. Here's uh, just some additional photos there of, of what it looked like prior and kind of what we're getting to now. Um, We've also, with the coffer dams in place, um, squaw uh, some of our um, biologists and, and uh, environmental resources folks, fisheries folks have been uh, conducting fish rescues uh, within that area. Um, and the contractor will be performing some slope stabilization uh, along a portion of the stream bank uh, just downstream of the dam. Um, just some other activities that are ongoing out there. And in conclusion, uh, 
as I mentioned, we rebid the project this year, and in April, our Board of Supervisors awarded a $1.88 million contract uh, to Powers Engineering out of Oakland uh, to perform the installation. We issued a notice to proceed in May. Um, similar to the first project I presented on, work schedule is uh, constrained by permit conditions. Uh, for this project, we're only allowed to work in the river from June 15th to October 31st. Uh, so we have just over four months to, to get all of this work done and completed. Uh, we do not anticipate any shutdowns of the transmission system, um, and we do not anticipate any service disruption as part of this project. Um, we plan to use the water contractors operators coordination meetings uh, to continue providing updates uh, regarding the project on a monthly basis. Um, and if there were to be any unanticipated impacts uh, to our water supply, we would uh, obviously be communicating that through the daily water production reports referenced earlier. Um, but as I mentioned, we don't anticipate any disruptions um, to, uh, to our service uh, throughout the project um, and aiming to uh, achieve substantial final completion in November, 2021. And that, that concludes my presentation. I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that folks may have. Thank you so much, Carlos, for the very, very thorough report. And thank you for stepping in um, for Kent and his unavailability. And with that, um, are there any questions from the WAC or TAC on this presentation? Madam Chair. Drew? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you, Carlos. Just a quick question on the the actual rubber bladder itself, when it was procured, is are there multiple vendors for that or did it end up being just one supplier that provided a bid? Uh, you know, I, I believe we did put out a, uh, a bid for that fabric and ended up settling on, on one supplier, but it, it, is, it is limited supply um, and I, I believe uh, came from all the way from China. So that was part of the concern over whether we were uh, going to be able to receive that material in time for construction last year. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, I had one. Uh, in the sure. past, when this, when the bladder has been infrequently replaced, I believe it came from uh, whatever the company was in uh, Japan, I think maybe two or three times, is, is no Japanese firm uh, you know, in that business anymore? Yeah, Jack, the, the last um, bladder that was put into place, which was in the late 90s, was, came from Bridgestone, the tire company. Okay. Um, in Japan. And um, we, we've only replaced it that one time, and this is the second oh. replacement. So, okay. um, and they do not manufacture them anymore. Okay, it's it's not a big market. I understand. No, there's not. Who, do you know? Are are there several or other uh, water agencies or, or, or I don't know what where, what else it could be used for that use this? Are we the only one in the world that do this sort of thing? No, there actually are quite a few agencies that use them. Alameda County Water District down in the Bay okay. Area uses them. Um, Orange there's, County. There's quite a few, but the, okay. The ability or the, the number of um, companies manufacturing them has really gotten much smaller. Yeah. I have a worry that sometime in the future, as they're so infrequently uh, uh, replaced, we'll find nobody does it anymore. Hopefully yeah, it doesn't hope. happen, but I know you'll be retired by then. So. Yeah, I hope you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. It, it makes it kind of hard when it's something that is only replaced, you know, every 20 years or so. Yeah, sure. It it doesn't help the market at all. No, uh, no. But I would imagine yeah. that, you know, as they become scarcer and scarcer, it's going to be one of those things where you kind of have to put it in an order years in advance so that yeah. they have the lead time uh, to be able to produce them. So right. great question. Right. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Other, other questions? 
I am not seeing any other hands or anyone else jumping forward. So um, with that, I will um, open this up for public comment. Uh, we are taking public comment on both projects for item 12. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via phone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And Secretary Perez, do I am not seeing any hands, are you? Nor do I. Nor do I, okay. Um, Drew, did you receive any verbal or written comments on item 12? I did not. Okay, with that, thank you uh, again, um, Carlos, for the very detailed presentation and look forward to uh, seeing that dam in place. Um, so that'll be awesome to be able to have a visit to see that. So thank you for that. Um, with that, we will move on to item 13, the integrated regional water management plan update. And I believe Grant that you're gonna take this item. Yeah, very briefly, uh, Chair. I. Uh, continue to urge the Water Supply Coordination Council members and our water contractors to stay on top and abreast of the two functioning areas because they've been uh, very successful over the years. But So briefly would just say that earlier uh, last month, the North Coast Resource Partnership, which can be accessed as northcoastresourcepartnership.org, held a meeting. Uh, they've got a very active and involved uh, governance structure that includes uh, supervisors from uh, the seven counties as well as tribal interests. And it's what's been allowing them to attract a lot of funding and uh, commitment for resources. And as we've got drought funding that's currently being negotiated uh, up in Sacramento, I would just urge us to stay involved and aware and, and looking for opportunities to work with the partnership to secure our priorities as a region. Secondly, uh, down in the Bay Area, as you know, we've been managing a multi-year contract, one of the biggest regional contracts the Bay Area has done, which is, is for AQPI, which is Advanced Quantitative Precipitation Information. The challenge is to put high-tech radar, uh, X-band radars throughout the Bay Area. I think there are seven locations right now, including efforts down in the Santa Cruz, Monterey Bay Area. But this is our commitment to get, uh, I know it's hard to imagine thinking about water supply when we're in the middle of a drought, but this is, as you remember, our activities to get these radars up and running for both fire and water and flood. And they will provide uh, much more granular information to resource managers and emergency responders on where we're going to experience uh, likely flooding in, uh, in the near term. So uh, through this project, we've been building the One Rain Network and Carlos, who you heard earlier today, has been instrumental in helping that happen. So I'm just calling attention to the WAC members that these are two regional forums that require us and, and call us to continue to participate and to be active in, to be bringing state resources into our region which we need to carry out some of the projects that were discussed earlier today. And that's my update. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, any questions about Grant's report? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I will open this up for public comment. We're now taking public comment on item 13. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And I am not seeing any hands raised. Gina, are you seeing any? I do not either. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Drew, have you received any verbal or written public comments on this item? I have not. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Grant, for that report. And everybody needs to kind of keep their eyes and ears open on this um, as we move forward. I think Grant stated it very well. There's a lot of projects going on, and I think we, you know, need the, that support from the state. So with that, I will move on to item 14, items for the next agenda. Are there any items that people would like to uh, put forward for our Meeting on September 13th, please raise your hand. I am not seeing any hands being raised. Chair Harvey, 
Yes. I just want to uh, make it clear that one one item will definitely be the the uh, special <laughs> WAC meeting on the and for the we for have. September thirteenth. And we hope that you will all meet to be able to finalize that item. Um, I know you guys have been working really hard, and I I have faith that you will be done um, for us on <laughs> September 13th. <laughs> and with that, then we will open this item up for public comment on item 14. If you wish to make a comment via Zoom, please raise your hand. If you're dialing in via telephone, please dial star nine to raise your hand. And are there any public comments on this item? Gina, I am not seeing any hands. I don't have any raised hands. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Drew, did you have any verbal or uh, written comments on this item? I did not. Okay, well, um, any other last comments from anyone before we adjourn this meeting? This is your last chance. <laughs> And I am not seeing anybody jump forward. Um, thank you again, Roberta and Gina and Easter for helping out. It's always greatly appreciated. And with that, we'll adjourn this meeting and we will all get together again on September 13th. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bye. Sir Harvey. See you, gang. <laughs>